All right, so moving on to first is a hue order immunity. Again, hue order immunity is going to be mediated by the B lymphocytes. If you remember what we discussed before the break, we started by having the cells produced from the bone marrow. B lymphocytes are gonna get their education in the bone marrow. The educated cells that are capable to recognize and bind to the non-self antigen. I'm able to recognize the non-self antigen. I am able to recognize MHC in case of T lymphocytes. And it's going to be not able to recognize here the other self antigen. We call those cells here after I make sure that they are capable to recognize their specific non-self antigen. They are recognizing MHC. They are not recognizing any other self antigen other than MHC. Those are my immunocompetent cells. But again, those immunocompetent cells are going to be without experience. So we call them naive cells. Where is the naive cells, if you remember, going to be getting their education or their internship? They will remain in the lymph nodes in the spring, waiting for getting exposed to this non self antigen they are specific to recognize. They are recognizing this antigen, they are capable to bind to it. So for the B lymphocytes, I have naive B lymphocytes, they are not activated. They are kept in my lymph nodes in my spleen. Each one of them has a surface and a surface receptor, which as we're gonna see is gonna be an antibody. This surface receptor is going to be responsible to recognize and bind to the specific non self antigen. So I've got multiple B lymphocytes, each one of them has its own type of immunoglobulin that acts as a surface receptor, and this immunoglobulin is again recognizing one specific non self antigen. All right, so let's say here, this one is recognizing the red antigen, this one is recognizing the blue antigen, this one is recognizing the green antigen. Each one has its own specific antigen that it can recognize and bind to. All right, so if I've got an infection and the pathogen causing this infection is gonna carry the red antigen. So which cell here gonna be able to recognize and bind to this antigen out of those three? So if I try to bind on here, would I bind with the blue uh, with the blue receptor on the blue B lymphocyte? I would fail to bind. Would I be able to bind to green one? Again, no, I would fail to bind. I would only be able to bind to the one that is specifically created to bind to me. I would only bind to this one. So what happens to this naive lymphocyte? This is the first encounter with 
its specific antigen. Yeah, it's pink, yeah. It's pink. And so anything that looks as red is for me red. All right. All right, so here, this B lymphocyte that is going to be recognizing this specific antigen, once it gets exposed to it, this is how it's a first encounter. So it's going to recognize it from any other antigen. So if I got other antigens around, I won't recognize them. I'm only going to be specifically recognizing and binding to the red one or the pink one. All right, so what happens when you recognize and bind to your specific antigen, those beam sites will become activated. And once they become activated, they start to proliferate, forming copies of themselves, uh, forming copies of itself. So rather than having only one cell, I form thousands and thousands of copies of this cell. And each one of those cells is going to carry the same exact receptor like the first cell. Each one of them is going to be capable to recognize and bind to the same exact antigen. So we call this is here the clonal selection. I have four clones of myself. And which one do I form the clones of? I only form the clones of the one who did recognize and bind to this antigen. So I form copies of myself, rapidly proliferating cells will be reduced and I will have lymphocytosis, having large number of lymphocytes. Those lymphocytes, a major part of them, gonna mature to become what we call the plasma cells. And the plasma cells on here will have a very large Golgi apparatus occupying major part of the size of the cell. Because they are not only for the B cells, clonal selection, uh, for the B cell that has recognized, not all the B cells are gonna be proliferating, just the B cell that has been exposed to its uh, specific non cell entity. This is the only one that's gonna get uh, activated to proliferate and produce copies of a cell. So, major number of those clones will become what we call the plasma cells. Or another name for the plasma cells, those are my effector cells, effector B lymphocytes. Those are the ones that will have an effect effector B lymphocytes or plasma cells. Those ones, how would they be conducting their effect? They will be producing antibodies, which are protein molecules. And that's why I have that large Golgi apparatus, which you find a major part of the size of the cell. I'm producing copies and copies of those immunoglobulins that have the ability to bind to the same exact antigen that I am recognizing. So again, again, what happens in here? I've got many B lymphocytes sitting around in my lymph, lymphoid tissue, in the lymph nodes and spleen, for example. Once I got an infection, some of the pathogenic antigens are gonna be drained through the lymphatic circulation and 
once they get exposed to the B cells that they are that are specific, specifically recognizing them, those B lymphocytes will have their first encounter because this first encounter, the antigen challenge. This is the first encounter between the antigen and the naive immunocompetent cell. Again, I've got my education. I'm an immunocompetent cell, but I don't have experience. I am a naive cell. All right, is this all most likely going to be taking place in the spleen and lymph nodes? And this explains why you're going to have swollen lymph nodes if you get an infection. So if you have uh, an infection, for example, in one of your teeth, this where you're going to feel that there will be enlarged lymph nodes of the neck, for example, or below the mandible. The antigen here provokes a humoral immune response. What happens as a result of this activation of the cell, the cells, once activated, they will start to proliferate, forming clones. copies of the same cells will be produced. And those clones will be identical to the mother cell. Some of them will become the plasma cells or the effective B lymphocytes. Why do we call them effective B lymphocytes? Those are the ones that will be responsible to produce an effect by producing those immunoglobulins, by producing those antibodies. Another part of those clones will become the memory B lymphocytes. So those are identical to the naive B lymphocytes, but those ones got an experience. They are faster to act once they get re-exposed to the same antigen. Once you get re-exposed to the same antigen, you are the fastest one to respond. You are the memory B lymphocyte. This is not naive anymore. It has been exposed to this specific non-self antigen and it has been previously activated. So again, again, what happens here, we are looking at B lymphocytes, naive cells that are immunocompetent, they got their education, but they didn't have experience. Once you've got exposed to the antigen, you are specifically recognizing you're gonna become activated as a B lymphocyte. This B lymphocyte will start to proliferate and forms clones of itself, copies, identical copies of itself. A large group of those, clone, of those clones will become plasma cells, and those are antibody producing cells. Another name for the plasma cells is gonna be the effective B lymphocytes. We're looking here, smaller number of the clones will become my memory B lymphocytes. Ready to respond once you get a re-exposure to the same antigen. So what happens if I got re-exposed to the same antigen like a year from now, so after one year, you got exposed another time. Those cells will have the ability to recognize the same antigen. So for example, if this was a rubella, for example, so I'm able now to recognize the same antigen of the rubella, and I would be proliferating, producing plasma cells, and I would be proliferating, forming other memory cells that would be kept to respond for another 
late exposure in the future. Uh, so what's the difference here between this here and this? It's the same thing. You've got the cell proliferating, producing plasma cells, and memory cells. You see on here, this one is what we call the primary immune response. And this one is a secondary immune response. The difference is not in what cells you are producing because you are gonna be producing the same exact cells that will be performing the same, the same exact effect. But the difference here is in the timing. We're looking at this graph. This is my prim primary immune response. This is the time on the x-axis. And this is the number of immunoglobulins that you have been producing. So in a primary immune response, this was my first exposure to the antigen. The first time I've been exposed to the antigen, antigen A. So what happens? On day zero, this is the time when I got exposed for the first time. It took me seven days for me to see immunoglobulins rising in my blood. Seven days when the pathogen is proliferating without any interference by, from, my, from the immune system. Just pathogen cells proliferating, causing harm to the cells without having immunoglobulins to bind to them. Seven days. I will reach the peak of the production within three days after I rise, I rise the Num number of immunoglobulins in the bloodstream. So by day 10 of the exposure, you're gonna reach the peak of the production of the immunoglobulin. Then the immunoglobulins will start to decline. I have a decline after day 10. What if I got re-exposed? A year from now, I got re-exposed by the same exact antigen, still antigen A. This is the time when I got exposed for the second time or any re-exposure to the same antigen. I will start to notice that there is a rise in the immunoglobulin levels in my bloodstream within a few hours. So here I waited seven days for me to detect immunoglobulins in, this, in the bloodstream. Here, the immunoglobulins are rising within hours. And I will reach the peak of the production of the immunoglobulins within three days of getting re-exposed. Within three days, I will reach the peak of the production. And can you compare here the level of production in a primary immune response and in a secondary immune response. Secondary immune response, you are producing much, much, much more immunoglobulins. And in a primary immune response, you are producing much less immunoglobulins. Yes. Clonal selection, clonal selection is what happens in here. When you are activating the B lymphocyte for the fir very first time, this is the clonal selection. You did select 
the type of B lymphocytes and you did form clones, some of the clones can then become to the memory B lymphocytes. On a re-exposure, when you get exposed by the same antigen another time, second, third, fourth, whatever time, you have memory B lymphocytes that have been exposed before to this antigen. So they have been activated before. So you don't take the time, this extra time, those seven days for you to start the formation of the plasma cells for you to start the production of the immunoglobulins. Here, I'm producing the immunoglobulins within hours. Here, I will get the immunoglobulins within seven days of getting exposed for the first time. All right, so memory cells are going to become activated when you get re-exposed. Second exposures, third, whatever exposure after the first exposure. Clonal selection is the very first time where you're going to get the naive B lymphocytes activated into clonal cells that will become plasma cells and memory B lymphocytes. Or did this answer your question, Martina and Michelle? All right, so looking here again, again, at the graph, back to our graph, looking at the, uh, the amount of immunoglobulins that you're gonna be producing in a primary immune response it's much less than the one produced during the amount of the immunoglobulins produced in my uh, secondary immune response. So don't confuse secondary immune response with second exposure. Yes, secondary immune response is gonna be taking place in secondary, tertiary, uh, any exposure, later, any later re-exposure, not only the second exposure, all right? So secondary immune response takes place with any re-exposure. So I'm producing much greater amount of immunoglobulins, not only greater amounts of immunoglobulins, I'm producing the immunoglobulins at a much faster rate. So I start the production within hours, I will reach the peak of the production within three days. Not only the quantity of the immunoglobulins that you're gonna be producing is much greater in the secondary immune response than the primary immune response, it's gonna also be of greater affinity to the antigen. What I mean, they have greater affinity to the antigen, they have the ability to bind in a stronger way to the antigen. So they bind to the antigen, they stick to it in a, a greater force compared to the ones that you're gonna be producing in a primary immune response. They have less affinity to the antigen. All right, so we're looking here the difference between a primary and the secondary immune response, and then we're gonna get to the question. So primary immune response again, I have a primary immune response resulting from the first exposure to the specific antigen. I have a lag period of three to six days, sometimes seven days as we've seen on the graph. The peak would be reached within 10 days of getting, ex of getting exposed. And then the antibody levels will decline after 10 days of getting exposed. In a secondary immune response, this takes place on a re-exposure to the same antigen. So I've got reactivated memory B cells sitting in my lymphoid organs 
waiting for the antigen. And once they get re-exposed to the same antigen, they will respond within hours. I don't need to have much time to recognize bind to the antigen to activate from scratch the B lymphocytes. They have been exposed to this. They've got enough. They have got experience dealing with this antigen. Antibody levels will reach their peak uh, within two to three days. And those are going to be much higher levels compared to the primary immune response. Antibodies produced in a secondary immune response will have a much greater affinity. They have stronger attachment to the antigen. Antibody levels can remain high for weeks to months. So rather than declining after 10 days, you see on here on the graph, I did have a decline after within 10 days. Here, the, it's, it's almost a, lot, a parallel line to the x-axis. So we're looking here at a much slower decline in the levels of the immune level. So Tyler, do the memory cells continue to be produced to allow for, say, for secondary response since foreign elements only remain a few days in the bloodstream? So here, those are not going to be kept in the blood. They are still going to be in, my, in, the lymph, in the lymphoid organs. So they are still going to remain in the lymphoid organs, not released like the plasma cells in the blood. So yes, so the cells can't proliferate within the bloodstream, including the memory cells. The memory cells are again going to be kept within the lymph nodes until you get re-exposed to the antigen. Until then, you're going to be getting your uh, getting activated into plasma cells, and so uh, producing the immune problem. Does this answer your question? All right, so when memory cells first produced, primary immune response, secondary immune response, neither primary immune response, exactly. Primary immune response is when I got exposed for the very first time. Uh, very first time to the antigen, so the activated B lymphocytes will be forming memory B cells. So, what if I did remove this word from the statement? What answer would it be? A and B, exactly. You're going to be producing memory cells in a secondary immune response and in a primary immune response. Here, both will be producing memory B lymphocytes. On here, in a re exposure, you're activating the memory B lymphocytes. Activated memory B lymphocytes will proliferate into plasma cells and other memory B. Uh, memory uh, memory uh, uh, B uh, memory B lymphocytes. Any questions? 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 All right. So, what are the types? of humoral immunity. We classify the humoral immunity according to whether you've got the antibodies. So again, again, humoral immunity is an antibody mediated immunity. So here I'm dealing with production of immunoglobulins, antibodies. 
The question now, how did you get those antibodies? Humoral immunity means you've got antibodies to bind to the anti. This is what simply means, what I mean by humoral immunity. Having antibodies, immunoglobulin. So what is the source here of those immunoglobulins? If you did it yourself, it's gonna be an active humoral immunity. What I mean by this, that you've got exposed to the antigen. So you've got a naive B lymphocyte without any experience, and those, this naive B lymphocyte got exposed to its specific antigen. It becomes activated, forming clones, and you're going to be producing plasma cells, producing those immunoglobulins, and you're going to be producing memory B lymphocytes that will be kept for later exposures again again active humoral immunity means that the cells have been in an inactive form naive b lymphocytes kept in your lymphoid organs and they got exposed to the antigen they are specific to so now the cells gonna become activated Clonal selection takes place, production of plasma cells, and formation of memory B cells. This is the source for my immunoglobulins. We call this again is my active humoral immunity. Active humoral immunity. So according to where did you get the antigen from? We're gonna classify the active humor immunity into two subtypes. Where did you get this antigen from? If you get it from the nature, it's gonna be naturally acquired. In other words, you've got the infection. You've got exposed to the pathogen that might have caused an infection for you. Now you have the you have been exposed to the antigen, and as you get exposed to the antigen, what's going to happen? Those na you, your naive B lymphocytes are going to become activated into plasma cells and memory cells. It might be something that you've got from. A lab. So we have been working with it. Work, let's say here, this is my bacteria. Like this. This is our bad guy on here. And rather than getting you exposed to the bacteria itself, we decided why don't we break it down and find the parts that are gonna be recognized by the immune system. So in the lab, we're gonna be looking for antigenic determinant. So we're gonna be breaking down the parts, either kill the bacteria or even give it a life, but after we remove the parts that could cause the harm. So for example, this bacteria is causing the harm by its teeth, let's say. So I would remove the teeth of the bacteria, so now uh, the bacteria is harmless. So it's a live attenuated, what we mean by a live attenuated bac uh, bacteria here, is that the part that caused the harm, that is toxic in this bacteria, has been removed. So, but the bacteria is still living. It's a live acting away to. So what do we call this process? If you give something that has been destroyed, 
dead or antigenic antigenic parts that could induce a new response that will be recognized by your naive DNA lymphocytes or something that is live attenuated, we call this as a vaccine. So in a vaccine, I'm exposing your naive B lymphocytes to here, the naive B lymphocytes to the antigens for them to become activated. And once they become activated, you're not only going to be producing the plasma cells that will produce the immunoglobulins for you, but they will be also forming memory. So they build up memory lymphocytes, memory B lymphocytes for you to not get a primary immune response when you get exposed to the to the pathogen, you, in the first exposure, you're gonna have a secondary immune response. You take hours to respond, hours for you to produce the immunoglobulins. You're gonna reach the peak within two to three days. The immunoglobulins are gonna be produced in larger amounts. They will remain for a longer time in your bloodstream. They will be of greater affinity to the antigen. So this is gonna be saving you those seven days on here. That's why we give a vaccine. Because in those seven days, there is no uh, suppression of the activity of the pathogen. I have the pathogen proliferating. I am infected to the others. I will be transmitting this infection to other people and I will be sick as well. And the infection might cause a lifelong complication, like having mumps, for example, it might cause uh, infertility in males. It's a lifelong complication for something that we have a vaccine for. And this is due to this infection that's gonna be taking place uh, without any suppression from the immune system because the immune system is still recognizing the antigen for the very first time. All right, so again, again, what we're looking at in here, we're looking at the activation of the bacteria itself. I've got an infection. We classify this humoral immunity as a naturally acquired active humoral immunity. It might be a vaccine which is either dead or live attenuated. What I mean by a live attenuated pathogen, it has been weakened. I did remove the parts that will be toxic. All right this vaccine is not natural. You need to prepare it. You need to look for the parts that will be recognized by the immune system. And that's why it takes them so long to find a vaccine. Because you don't know what parts are the ones which are causing the harm. You don't know yet what parts are gonna be inducing the immunological reaction going to be activating the immune system. What is the amount that you should be taking? Whether you're going to be taking one dose, you're going to need booster doses later on or not for you to get an immune response. So you don't know what exact part you should be finding on the pathogen that will be inducing the activation of the B lymphocytes for those B lymphocytes to form memory memory cells for later exposures for re-exposure. So what if I have now an epidemic or a pandemic or uh, a virus that is spreading or a bacteria that is spreading in 
in the school, in one school, for example. So is a vaccine something good for me now? I might have been exposed to the infection. I might have the virus now. And I might get sick in a few days or weeks. Is a vaccine going to be something helpful for me at this point? What do you think? No, the vaccine is a weakened bacteria. The vaccine does not weaken the bacteria. A vaccine is a bacteria. So I've got the bacteria here. I did remove the teeth of the bacteria and I injected the bacteria itself. So if I have an ongoing infection in the community, is a vaccine gonna be helpful for those who got exposed? to the infection. No, it's too late, exactly. Actually, I have been exposed to the, to, the, to the virus or the bacteria. So vaccine at this point is not helpful. It won't do anything for me now. I might have been exposed. What I'm trying to do is to not be spreading the infection, is to not get sick. So vaccine for me, it's not going to be helpful at this point. So what would I need to be looking at? I need to get preformed immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins that can directly attack the pathogen. I don't want to be waiting for, an, for the next generation to have a vaccine, I need protection. Now, so I will go to the lab and what we're gonna be trying to do, we're gonna be trying to find which B cells are gonna be activated, what genes and those B cells are making them specific to this antigen. I first need to find which one did respond. What is the shape of, the, of this immunoglobulin? And according to this gene that I will be determining, and try to imagine you're looking for uh, like a penny in, in the desert. After you find it, what you're going to be trying to do, you're going to be trying to splice this gene and try to form copies, lots of copies of the gene. And we're going to be using, so what we were doing was, was to inject animals with the virus and extract the immunoglobulins, for example, a horse. We got the virus or the bacteria, so we're gonna be injecting the horse with the virus or the bacteria, and the horse is the one that who's gonna be responding to the, to the pathogen, and we're gonna be extracting the immunoglobulins from the horse and give, give this immunoglobulin, this preformed immunoglobulin, to give an immediate protection. So it's something that is passive. What I mean by passive here, you did not activate your naive immune cells. So if you've got, if one of the labs today working on getting a, an immunoglobulin prepared, and it was effective for the corona COVID-19.
getting this immunoglobulin did give me, if it was effective, did give me an immediate protection. It did bind to the viral particles, preventing its spread, preventing more infection to take place. So this is going to provide me with an immediate protection, which is very good. But if I got re-exposed to the same virus later in life, do I have an immunity against the virus? What do you think? I got exposed today to the virus, and in order for me for me to not get sick, I've got immune preformed immunoglobulins, immunoglobulins that have been prepared in the lab. And those preformed immunoglobulins are gonna be injected in me, giving me an immediate protection, which is something good. But what happens later on, a year from now, if I got re-exposed to the same virus or the same passage, do I have immunity against this virus? The answer is you don't. why you don't have immunity against this virus that you got re-exposed to it, but you have taken those immunoglobulins to prevent the infection from taking place. Simply, you did not activate your own naive B lymphocytes. Memory cells have not been produced exactly. So I, relied on external help here. My naive B lymphocytes are still naive. They didn't have any experience and now they are still without experience. But what I have now is just an immediate protection that won't last forever. Those immunoglobulins are protein molecules that could be broken down over time. It's a matter of time for them to vanish from my system. So here, I don't have an immunological memory. No memory going to be formed. So it's going to be a passive humoral immunity. Is this something that nature did provide you with, or is this something that has been prepared in the lab? It's something that has been prepared in the lab, this is gonna be artificially acquired passive humoral immunity. Anti-venome is gonna be a chemicals that will be preventing not an immunological response, but the harm. They act in the same way like the antibodies. Yes, but most likely they are chemicals rather than proteins in most of the cases. Right, so I got exposed to a chemical. I tried to find the antidote to the chemical, another chemical that would be reducing the uh, effect of the injected toxin. All right, it's it's very similar. It's a very similar idea to the antibodies that we get injected. All right, so here it's naturally acquired. Can I get preformed immunoglobulins without the need of a lab? Yes. Who loves you more than big companies to get your money? Can you guess whom? Your mom. Your mom loves you more than big companies. Try
trying to prepare the vaccine, trying to prepare the immunoglobulin for you to bite. Your mom loves you and she will give you the immunoglobulins for free. During pregnancy, those immunoglobulins are going to be traveling down through the placenta. And during lactation as well. And this is why we ask the mothers to breastfeed their, their infants. Because they are not only giving them nutrients, they are providing them with an umbrella of immunoglobulins to face this new world with fill of passing. So I do imagine fetus sitting there, everything is clean inside, you don't have uh, any exposure to any kind of pathogen, and then all of a sudden you're thrown out in this environment. So you need an immediate protection. You have a very weak immune system at this point, so you need an immediate protection. Your mom is the one who's gonna be providing you with this immediate protection. It's still passive, it won't last. So if your mom was vaccinated, this won't be transmitted to you. She will just give you some protection until a full maturation of the immune system where you're gonna be taken off. Yes, exactly, the cluster, the cluster. The clostrum is filled with immunoglobulins. Highly, highly beneficial to the infant. All right, so again, again, what we've discussed so far uh, concerning the types of humor immunity, we've got active humor immunity, passive humor immunity. What we mean by active humor immunity, we mean simply we've got an activation taking place in the uh, for the BD lymphocytes. It might be taking place in a natural way. You've got exposed to the infection, you've got you got exposed to the real pathogen, you've got an infection, you have been spreading the infection around. It's a naturally acquired active humor humor you might have the vaccine and the vaccine might be living bacteria but or living pathogen but has been modified for it to not cause harm or it might be a dead pathogen so both according to which one so in some cases the dead pathogen won't induce an immunological response so it won't activate the beam of the so that's why in some cases we need to give a living uh, pathogen that has been modified to not cause a harm, but still induce the immune response, the activation of the naive beam of the science. Vaccines will spare us the symptoms of the primary immune response. Remember, you need, you take four, six, seven days until you start the production of the immunoglobulins. They are looking for antigenic determinants that can induce the immunological response, that can activate the B lymphocytes. Not any part of the bacteria or any part of the virus can induce the immune response. It's not that easy. You need to find the parts, the right parts, and you might need to get them attached to other larger molecule, molecules in order for them to induce the immunological response. So it's a very com complicated uh, task. It's not something easy. It needs millions of dollars to be spent in order for, for you to uh, figure out uh, a suitable vaccine other than the trials that you're gonna to need to perform after that to make sure that this actually works. 
Downside here is that it's only going to be activating one type of helper T cells. Actually, we won't be discussing the different types of helper T cells. Uh, so this is a side note that you might be discussing later on if you're taking microbiology. Uh, all right, so just keep it in the back of your mind. This is not a, a, an information that we are focusing on in this chapter. All right, so passive humoral immunity, it's gonna be either, again, naturally acquired or it's gonna be artificially acquired. Naturally acquired, those are antibodies delivered to the fetus through the placenta or the infant through lactation. It might be artificially acquired by injecting serum containing the gamma globulins, containing the immunoglobulins, containing the antibodies to provide you with, again, protection now, an immediate protection. B cells are not challenged by the antigen, so the naive cells haven't been exposed to the antigen, so they will remain naive. No activation means no memory. If you got three exposed to the antigen later on, or you, I mean, if you got three exposed to the pathogen later on, you gonna have a primary immune response. You're gonna have the infection. So what we do is after an outbreak, we're gonna be given, uh, during the outbreak, we're gonna be given immunoglobulins to provide people with an immediate protection. And later on, we're gonna be giving them the vaccine to develop a uh, lifelong protection against this uh, passage. All right, so some, some will require multiple doses like for example, if you're, you're taking, I, I believe most of you did already take uh, the uh, uh, the B uh, the hepatitis B vaccine, multiple doses, uh, multiple shots. All right. So looking here at what part of the humor immune defense uh, includes getting a flu vaccine. Which one in here, what kind of immunity do we consider this as? So it's gonna be artificially acquired active, exactly. Artificially acquired active. So I've seen a question here uh, what is the difference between B and T cells? Is it only in the growth? So we didn't mention, we didn't discuss anything about the activity of the T lymphocytes yet. Uh, so all what we've been discussing was the activity and the activation of only B lymphocytes. Here we're talking about only B lymphocytes. All this is what we're talking about here. We, all this was my humoral immunity. This is what we're focusing on in this part. All right. We did not discuss yet the T lymphocytes. This is going to be in our next class. All right. So, again, again, all the clonal formation, uh, clonal selection, antigen challenge, uh, memory B lymphocytes, all this uh, plasma cells. Everything that we've discussed so far is regarding only the B lymphocytes, only humoral immunity. We did not discuss the cell mediated or the cellular immunity, T lymphocytes yet. All right. We did stop our discussion about the formation of the, of the T lymphocytes when we discussed the growth and the formation of the uh, immunocompetent cell. After that, we are only, we did only focus, so we did stop our discussion about the T lymphocytes at this point, once they become immunocompetent. 
because they both are naive. B naive naive B lymphocytes and naive T lymphocytes. Where we did talk about only the naive B lymphocytes. We did not talk yet about the naive T lymphocytes. The question for today is going to be to mention here. Let me write this down. All right, so the question today is going to be to mention the different stages of the formation, activation of the BM. So, so you're going to mention uh, it started from the bone marrow, then they will be passing through uh, traveling, uh, tra they will remain to become immunocompetent in the bone marrow. And as they become, they, in order to become immunocompetent, I need to pass through multiple stages. They have to become able to recognize and bind to my specific antigen. I need to become able to recognize MHC. I need to not be able to not recognize any other self antigen. After that, the naive T of B lymphocytes will have the first exposure, which is the antigen challenge. Antigen challenge is going to be followed by the clonal clonal selection. This is going to result in formation of plasma cells and formation of the memory B cells. Plasma cells, please mention also that it's going to be responsible for the production of the immune globe, just in a primary immune response. Uh, so those are the stages. Formation uh, takes place in the bone marrow, formed in the bone marrow. Then you're going to pass through the education part, where you're going to be able to recognize and bind the specific antigen. You recognize MHC. You fail to recognize any other self antigen, becoming a naive B lymphocyte. Once you get exposed to the antigen, we have antigen challenge followed by clonal selection, resulting in the formation of plasma cells and memory B lymphocytes. Memory B lymphocytes are the ones that could be producing the immunoglobulins or the antigens. Any questions for me? So I will keep you updated. Once I, I hear back from the college, what they will be able to do in regards 
of uh, sponsoring uh, the proctor, the online proctor life board. Uh, I will let you know once I hear back from them and I will be uh, modifying the exam to fit the one if they did reach uh, an agreement with any of the Yes, you can use, uh, you can use the answer, the answer sheet is editable, put it in whatever way you want. Like you want to list them, you want to remove all the numbers and put it as an essay, put it in the answer sheet. So what I was willing from the answer, what I wanted to do, make sure that you add on each one of those answer sheets is your name and your course day and time. Yes, exactly. Evan, we've got everything. We're gonna be adding everything as a single PDF file. Scan the old ones that we've completed in class. Complete the new ones that we are having uh, here uh, during those virtual meetings and have one big PDF file that you're gonna be able to submit it on Canvas. So you're gonna see under module four, we're gonna have something called the uh, pop quizzes and in class activities. So when you press on it, it's gonna ask, you're gonna find a place where you're gonna be able to upload the file. Can you accept my request? Yes, uh, I, I just, so I usually check the group like two, three times a day. So once I, and the class I will, I will check it out and I will definitely upload. Our lab exams are gonna be completed through Canvas, but not on Canvas. I will tell you exactly uh, how to access, access it as once I know which platform is I decide to use or whether I won't be using any. So I will be going forward and give you the information about talk to you because not every uh, every uh, platform is gonna have the same exact uh, way. Facebook group link is in the big announcement that we've got this very big announcement has the Facebook uh, group link. It takes me seven to eight hours to just uh, run the video and upload it. It takes a, lo a lot of time to get it uploaded. So I start usually to upload after my second class today. So by 8 p.m. or something like this, I will start to upload. So it takes four or five hours to upload on YouTube. Uh, so uh, usually by, by late night, it's gonna be available on the Facebook. Only in PDF file is gonna be accepted. Is this gonna be the most convenient way for you to not have uh, misarrange, misarrangement in the file? We don't wanna have any problems with the file because those files are gonna be submitted on the very last day of the semester. So I don't wanna have anybody who gonna have a problem with them because I would be submitting the grade. So if you're not familiar with how to do, uh, uh, to create a PDF file using a word, I, I can show you all of you next, uh, next class. Uh, as the beginning of next class. Just remind me at the beginning of next class to show you how can you add everything in a Word document and save it as a PDF file. It's so easy, it doesn't, 
uh, need anything. And you can use your uh, college username and password, your college account to download the Microsoft uh, Office uh, for free from the website. So just type on Google uh, Office uh, 360 for students. It will pop up, it will ask you to put your email and college email and password. You're gonna be routed to the college website and then it will allow you to give you access to download uh, the office uh, software. MHC and self antigen different are they both uh, about not paying your own cells. MHC is a self antigen but it's going to be required for you to recognize non-self antigens that will be presented on top of them. So let's say after. So So if this is one of my cells, like this, it has MFC and it has other self antigens. All those are mine. I have no problem with that. MFC, as we're going to learn in details next class, are going to be carrying non-self antigens in some cases, like in a virus infected cell, for example. So if the virus is inside, parts of the virus, which are not mine, are non-self antigens, are gonna be presented attached to the MRC, and we're gonna learn the different types of MRC later, next class. So here, in order for the cell, especially the T lymphocytes to recognize, the non-self antigens I need first to have a stable attachment to the cell that it's testing. So it first needs to recognize and bind to the MHC, and then it needs to recognize and bind to the non-self antigen on top of the MHC. Yes, MHC is a self antigen, but it's you are you are in need to recognize it to be able to recognize the other non self antigens that will be attached to it. All right, does this answer your question, Rachel? We're gonna be discussing much more about MH, uh, MHC uh, next uh, next. Facebook, yeah, AP2 virtual meetings recordings. Uh, so double check the announcement on Canvas. You should be able to uh, find it's the only Facebook link. On it. If you can't click on the link, just select it because some, some browsers have uh, pop up blockers. So when you try to press on the link, your browser doesn't allow you to go to another page. So just select the uh, address, the website address, copy it in your browser and it should work. Any other questions for me today? Any questions? All right, thank you so much everybody and stay safe, stay home as long as you can and have a good weekend we'll see you on tuesday if you got any questions please send them to me either on the chatting area on canvas or by email all right we'll see you on tuesday enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend have a good one. You as well. Thank you.